start? Yeah. Okay. Thank yep. you. Good afternoon. Um, without a quorum being present, I now call to order the January 26, 2023 meeting of the Hudson River Park Trust Board of Directors. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and the video will be posted on the Trust website and a stenographer will provide a transcript of the meeting. Um, the directors have received the agenda materials in advance of this meeting and are free to ask questions or comment at any time on the action items submitted for approval, approval today. Please note, however, questions or comments from the audience will not be entertained at this meeting. I note that the board memos and resolutions on today's agenda have been posted on the Trust website in the link entitled Board Meetings, Bylaws, and Other Materials under Board Agendas and Minutes, and thus are available to the public. We are going to divert from the agenda a little bit and start off with the Friends Report from Connie Fishman. Thank you. Um, I have to say it's giving me a little PSD to be back at this podium after <laughs> all these years. <laughs> Uh, thank you. It's nice to see everybody again. Um, I'm going to do a brief recap in this report of some of last year's highlights. Uh, so it's a little bit longer than normal. Uh, our 22 volunteer season ended in December, um, and we succeeded in getting back to pre-COVID numbers, um, in fact exceeding our previous highs in 2019. There were 108. Okay. There were 108 volunteer events and just under 2,200 volunteers participated. 44 corporations participated, which is slightly less than we had in 2019, but um, a fairly large number of them actually participated multiple times. So we exceeded the number of days that the staff was involved with volunteers. Um, we think this is because there is such a focus now on keeping employees engaged in part keep as many as possible coming to the office, um, which is good for the volunteer business. Um, and they are interacting in person with their colleagues in those situations rather than just working from home. Um, so hopefully this kind of thing will encourage people to want to spend more time with their colleagues at the office. The volunteers logged more than 7,200 hours of labor working with the trust and friends staff on horticulture projects, composting, oyster research, shoreline cleanups, and staffing public events like Pumpkin Smash and the Submerged Marine Science Festival. In addition to the corporate events, there were Saturday green teams, neighborhood gardeners, compost ambassadors, and special events. We celebrated the volunteers last night, actually. Thank you, Robert and Maureen, for coming um, at an annual thank you party that we have. Uh, we've reached current staffing capacity, though, at Friends for this program, so in our new budget, we're going to uh, be hiring additional seasonal staff and possibly one more permanent staff person in order to allow us to keep growing this program. Also connected to the corporate membership growth, we will officially launch our, launch our business council in the spring with an event welcoming new members and offering an opportunity for existing members who contribute at the $25,000 level to be grandfathered in. We're hoping that new corporations will see the value of joining as yet another way to engage with their employees, support the park, and take advantage of community service opportunities to enhance their neighborhood. Um, current business council members include BlackRock, Peel Hunt, Remap, Related, Boston Consulting Group, Brookfield Properties, the Meatpacking Bid, CBRE, City, KKR, Blank Street, L'Oreal, Warburg Pincus, Blackstone, Pfizer, and Turner Construction. So we're sort of launching this with those members and I think it's a great head start for attracting other companies. Our individual membership also was very successful. Our year-end campaign in December uh, was our highest so far. One of the after effects of the pandemic, I think, has continued to be an increased appreciation of parks and open space, and it's showing up in the numbers of new small donor contributions and new entry-level memberships. Our website, digital, and social media numbers also reflect this growth with visitorship to HudsonRiverPark.org web pages in 2022 exceeding 2 million for the first time. This is partially due to improvements that the trust and friends made together to the homepage last year, 
which help better direct traffic to the specific activities and location pages people were interested in and put the viewer's attention on more important initiatives. Our email open rate now averaging 33%, um, which still sounds like impossible to me, but apparently that's what it is. Um, it's doubled over the previous year with a return of full season events and activities in the park. Uh, and the social media audience grew by more than 100,000 followers across all the platforms, Instagram being the highest with a major expansion in video content um, to compete with TikTok. We're also now live on the Bloomberg Connect smartphone app, which functions as a free museum style guide for cultural arts and open space organizations and is 100% supported by Bloomberg Philanthropies Pro Bono. Um, and I highly recommend, if you haven't seen it, downloading it from the App Store and taking a look. Um, there's amazing content for more than 100 organizations now, um, and the park in particular, they were really excited about, about because we are the first one on there that has our kind of public education and science content um, in an open space environment. And lastly, our gala um, was back in October. Um, we're at about 85% uh, revenue-wise of where we were in 2019, which is up from 50 last year and probably 15 uh, for our virtual gala, uh, which we hope to never do again. Um, uh, the room is still slightly less crowded. We sell about 700 tickets now. Um, we might grow a little bit, but we have found that you know, we used to sell a thousand and the room just gets unbearably crowded. We think that staying at this level is much nicer for our guests. Um, this year's gala will be October 12th. We already have it on the calendar. Um, we would love to see you all there. You have plenty of time to worry about what to wear. Um, and we will also be celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Hudson River Park Act. Um, that will be the culmination of an anniversary themed PR and media campaign that we'll be doing from the spring through the fall. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, and always, I'm available for anything else you would like to discuss outside of the context of, context of this meeting. So, thanks. Thank you, Connie. The president's report. And now we will move to the president's report. Ms. Doyle. Thank you. I'm, I think you can get a sense from Connie's presentation of how amazing this partnership with Friends is and how it is growing, truly. Uh, I, Connie deserves a shout out, her whole team does, but I think what's great about it in part is that it's so layered throughout different levels and staff positions at our organization. It's definitely not just the two of us. Um, so I think that that is just a really great thing, the corporate program, other things like that are things that make so much sense given our specific location in Hudson River Park and where we are and how many corporate business neighbors we have, so it's, it's great. You should come up and, <laughs> and maybe we just do the official agenda then. All right, <laughs> now with the quorum being present, we can move on to our consent agenda. There are four items on the consent agenda. One, approval of minutes and ratification of the actions taken at the December 1st, 2022 meeting of the Hudson River Park Trust Board of Directors. Two, authorization to extend contract term with Operations Inc. for payroll services. Three, authorization to amend contract with DLC Consulting for Pier 40 Garage Operations Auditing and Oversight Services, and four, authorization to amend contract with High Road Press LLC for print production and mailing services. Unless anyone has any comments, I will now call for a motion to approve all of the items on the consent agenda. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Extensions. The motion is approved. The first corporate action before the board is authorization to contract with Q&A Events and Productions LLC for Hudson River Dance Festival Production Services. Ms. Doyle. 
Since 2015, the Trust has presented a free two-day dance festival at the park's Pier 63 Lawn Bowl. In collaboration with the Joyce Theater, the dance festival welcomes world-class performers to the park and provides the public with a unique, high-quality cultural experience on a stage set against a backdrop of a Hudson River sunset. In accordance with the Trust Procurement Guidelines, the Trust released a request for proposals for the Hudson River Dance Festival production services on November 30th and received seven proposals on the submission deadline of January 6, 2023. The Trust Selection Committee reviewed the submissions according to the RFP selection criteria and then interviewed the three top-ranked firms. Trust staff has identified Q&A, Events and Productions, LLC, a New York-certified WBE firm as the most qualified proposer offering a fee and cost proposal that is fair, reasonable, and aligns with standard industry rates. Q&A has extensive experience successfully managing full-scale productions, including for the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's River to River Festival and prior years producing the Trust Dance Festival. Trust staff best requests board authorization to enter into a contract with Q&A Events and Productions, LLC, for Hudson River Dance Festival production services for a one-year term with four renewal options for a total board authorized amount of up to $1,042,529 over the five-year period. Funding for the contract will be available from the trust operating budget as approved by the Board of Directors each year. Are there any questions or comments? Are there any questions or comments? Move to adopt. <laughs> Unless anybody has any comments, which I guess Lowell does not. Someone um, moved. I made a motion. I will now call for a motion to approve all of the items in the consent agenda. I'll wait till you get to your script next time. <laughs> so, thank you. Any seconds? Have we been loyal? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion is approved. Project, you just do Q and A. Oh, it's it's true, true. Wrong page. <laughs> so I have to call for a motion to authorize the trust to contract with Q&A in Productions LLC for Hudson River Dance Festival Production Services. Is that what we just did? With his consent agenda. I did the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Seconds. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thanks, Chris. Abstentions. That motion is now approved. Okay, the second corporate action item before the board is authorization to amend the contract with Eastern Plumbing and Mechanical Contracting Inc. for Pier 97 Building Plumbing Construction. Ms. Doyle. At its December 2nd, 2021 meeting, the board ratified a contract with Eastern Plumbing and Mechanical Contracting Inc. for Pier 97 Building Plumbing Work. The Pier 97 building will house public restrooms, a small concession, and a maintenance and operation space for the park. Previously approved contracts for Pier 97 include removing a hot box that hosts the water supply infrastructure for the Clinton Cove portion of the park. Removal of the hot box will newly allow the trust to create an unobstructed esplanade near the Pier 97 bow notch. While preparing for the new irrigation connection, it was discovered that the infrastructure in the existing hot box supplies water to the Pier 96 boathouse in addition to the Clinton Cove irrigation system. To remove this equipment from the Esplanade as planned and still supply water to the boathouse, a new water service main will need to be provided from within the Pier 97 building, necessitating larger plumbing equipment and piping to accommodate the increased water capacity. The additional cost of such infrastructure is $160,000. While this increase modestly exceeds 20% of the initial total board authorized contract amount, Staff believes that it is in the Trust's best interest to amend the existing contract with Eastern Plumbing. Undertaking a new competitive procurement specifically for the new plumbing work would result in considerable delay to the opening of the new Pier 97 building. Further, the existing permits for construction are specific to Eastern, and adding a new plumbing contractor to work alongside Eastern in the Pier 97 building would require new coordination with regulatory agencies. Costs would also increase due to the need for coordination between the plumbers and delays to the Eastern's current schedule. Trust staff therefore requests board authorization to amend the contract with Eastern Plumbing and Mechanical Contracting Inc. for the Pier 97 plumbing construction work by an additional $160,000 for a total board authorization amount of up to $924,500. Any questions or comments? If not, I will call for a motion to authorize the trust to amend the contract with Eastern Plumbing and Mechanical Contracting Inc. 
for Pier 97 building plumbing construction. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion is approved. The third corporate action item before the board is authorization to amend the contract with Versig LLC for parkwide access control upgrade. Ms. Doyle. The trust utilizes an access control and security camera system to meet physical security needs like securing doors, managing access rights, and tracking user access at most of the park's buildings and rooms. At its October 1st, 2020 meeting, the board authorized the trust to enter into a contract with Versig LLC for parkwide access control upgrades for a contract amount of up to $468,334 over a three-year term. Since that time, Versig has installed Genetech's security camera and access control software, as well as access control readers and supporting hardware at various buildings located throughout the park, while also conducting ongoing maintenance for all access systems. Additional access control readers and hardware and associated maintenance are now needed at several locations, including the Pier 45 and Pier 51 comfort stations, West 44th Street Park Building, Pier 26 Utility Building, Pier 76 Building, and at several locations within Pier 40. In addition, the continuing expansion of the park's security camera network, network requires the purchase of new licenses. Versig is both an OGS centralized contractor and a New York certified SDVOB vendor and has a proven track record of successfully working with the trust. Versic's pricing for the equipment and services continues to be within the range of the rates of other qualified vendors on the OGS centralized contract, and Versic is the only certified SDVOB vendor that supplies Genetech software and hardware, which allows the park security network to be integrated with NYPD's Lower Manhattan Security Initiative. The trust staff therefore requests board authorization to amend the contract with Versig LLC for parkwide access control upgrades by an additional $248,000 for a total board authorization amount of up to $716,334 and to extend the contract term by an additional six months to March 31st, 2024. Funding for this amendment is available in the trust capital and equipment budget as approved by the board. Any questions or comments? So, so the new locations, the latest locations will be more than a new before or? Good question, I asked that too. Uh, they are uh, doors within buildings, additional doors within addition, within buildings that had already had primary access, but this uh, these are two additional doors within those areas. Okay. Any other questions? If no, I will call for a motion to authorize the trust to amend the contract with Versig LLC for parkwide access control upgrade. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion is approved. Thank you. That completes the board action items for approval today. Um, I would now like to ask Ms. Doyle to present the President's report. Thank you. This past Monday, January 23rd, the Finance Committee met to review the preliminary budget for fiscal year 23-24, which will commence on April 1st. Our CFO, Kim Quinones, and Senior and Vice President uh, of Finance, Sikander Zibori, both are here, uh, presented the preliminary budget in detail and to comply with state finance law, we've also now posted the preliminary budget on our website and at five physical locations throughout the park, including the Pier 40 lobby. In March, the Finance Committee will again convene to review the budget and staff will provide a full budget presentation to the board at the next meeting, scheduled for Tuesday, March 28th. I'm flagging that date because we obviously need a quorum that date in order to pass a budget in time for the new fiscal year. So please let Christine Casey I know if for whatever reason there's a conflict, uh, as much in advance as you can, and we will try to make sure that we get a meeting date in late March. Uh, Kim was scheduled to present uh, the update, a brief overview of the preliminary budget, but she has lost her voice, um, so I'm going to take over for that. Um, I'd like to just highlight a few drivers of our budgetary needs in FY 2024. We will be opening about seven and a half acres of new public park space this summer, along with three public restrooms that are brand new. These facilities bring additional public safety, maintenance needs, they call for an increase in staffing, materials, and services. We're expecting continued inflationary pressures in several areas ranging from supplies to rentals to construction costs 
everything from portalettes to uniforms just cost more right now. On the income side, we're also projecting revenues of approximately $37.2 million, slightly less than the projected actuals for FY23, but an 8% year-over-year budget increase. As we discussed with the Finance Committee, in FY23, the Trust benefited from unbudgeted, non-recurring inflows. The preliminary budget proposes a total of $31.7 million in budgeted operating expenses, inclusive of personal services, which is an 11.4% increase as compared to the total budget. This produces a budgeted net operating surplus of 5.5 million, but that is before capital maintenance net of reimbursement. Once net cap M of 11.8 million is factored in, an operating deficit of 6.3 million is budgeted. If this deficit is realized, it would be funded from the trust reserves. In the current fiscal year, expenses are projected to be 4.2 million below a budget of 28.5 million. Postponement of some expenses, staff vacancies and or, defer, or deferred hiring, supply chain and similar issues that have delayed our ability to make certain large purchases, and lower than expected costs for certain large contracted services account for most of this. A budgeted operating deficit of 4.2 million is now projected to be a surplus of 5.1 million. As you know, the trust uses any surpluses to support capital maintenance and to replenish the trust reserves. We'll update these FY24 budget numbers in March as necessary and return to the Finance Committee and to the Board with a final proposed budget to be considered at the March 28th Board meeting. The approved budget will then be posted on our website and again throughout the park. I'll pause there for any questions, and I'd also like to thank Kim and Sekunder and all the department heads who have worked very hard to produce the budget in time for this schedule. Does this budget reflect any deferred maintenance, deferred cap, cap, capital maintenance, or is it everything you wanted to do that's in, for the year, or you could do for the year? Uh, there's always a wish list for capital maintenance for us, and that is in part a budgetary-based uh, wish list, and in part it's a bandwidth issue. So right now we're obviously doing a ton of new construction, and there's only so much that in any given year we can push out. As we look at next year, um, we are expecting the um, air rights revenue that we got for Pier 40 to basically have been depleted, and there are some large expenses. Last time you, we talked a lot about sprinklers, um, at the section of roof over the trust's offices and below the field on the roof, uh, on the roof um, will have to be redone at some point in the next few years. In its own right, that one project is going to be very costly. So something like that, the surplus that I just identified, um, we would expect to just be channeling back into Pier 40, depending on your approvals of the path and moving ahead. Sure. Um, increases are in. I have my budget somewhere, but um, by memory, the main increases are in personal services. Um, we are projecting six additional full-time employees. Um, we have increases in security costs, larger park, um, more sanitation, janitorial services. Uh, if you look, Commissioner, at um, Actually, Exhibit 1, um, if you look at total personal services, which is roughly the middle of the page, and then um, the area below that, the OTPS section, yeah. some of the larger expenses we plug out there, janitorial sanitation, um, security, presumed increase in the contract with PEP, um, even parking management if you're 40, you can see how the increases start adding up there. There are a couple of other areas. Um, uh, as we work on the gateway planning, we're expecting that that is a cost um, of about $400,000 is what we've budgeted, um, where we'll need to work with Amtrak on that, but that's an example of a cost where we would expect that from a budget perspective we're projecting about 350000 of that 400000 ex estimated expenditure would be reimbursed to us, but we have to flow that through the budget as well. 
And then the extra um, security, that's just the PEP contract? I think we had a modest allowance for if, for example, at the Chelsea Waterside Comfort Station, if we thought at some point that maybe there were a few more eyes on something like that at certain hours, maybe that's an example of a test case for some private security supplement. We're not really sure yet, but we put a little bit of an allowance in for that. Is that is, I'm looking at Rob Rodriguez. Um, I'm accurate with that? Yeah, about four minutes. Okay. That's primarily PEP, and what we're principally seeking to do, and you know, we're discussing this with um, Parks at the moment, but uh, one of the ideas that we think would be very helpful is to increase the number of sergeants on duty um, for kind of higher level oversight if, if we're able to achieve that, and we'll be talking with the commissioner and her staff. Any other budget questions? Okay. We can do our uh, design and construction report. So, we hosted a chilly but cheerful groundbreaking ceremony for the Pier 26 Science Play Area on December 14th. Thank you, uh, Director Pastor, for joining us for that. Um, well, Director Frederick was also there. We were honored to be joined by New York State Senator Brian Kavanaugh, New York State Assembly Member Deborah Glick. Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine, City Council Member Chris Marte, and Trisha Joyce of Community Board One, and of course Mike Novogratz, Connie Fishman, and many other members and staff from Hudson River Park Friends. As we all know, Mike was the Friends Chair until last year, and he and Connie and our very own former President Madeline Wills worked together to create a successful private fundraising campaign, with Mike ultimately giving $1.4 million himself. I'm glad that we were able to publicly thank and celebrate Mike, friends, Borough President Levine, Council Member Marte, and former City Council Speaker Corey Johnson, who all also stepped forward with funding. And we've promised them all that we will aim to have the new playground completed in time for a warmer weather celebration at the end of this year. On that note, I'm pleased to say that our contractor, Alpine Construction, is currently submitting shop drawings and procuring construction materials, as well as performing ground penetrating radar and other pre-construction work, and plans to start excavating the site of the science playground by February 1st. Monstrum, the Danish play equipment manufacturer constructing the centerpiece play sturgeons and related equipment, is hard at work fabricating equipment for an April delivery to the site. Moving north, I'm pleased to inform you that the park's tennis courts, located just north of Spring Street, reopened in time for the new year. Tennis enthusiasts were quick to notice with play resuming that very afternoon the, that we quietly reopened the gates. They are currently open with temporary striping and final color service will be installed in early spring when weather permits. With a good January weather, many are enjoying playing tennis on the newly refurbished courts. As I mentioned at our December meeting, our neighbors at 550 Washington Street completed construction of the new crosswalk south of Pier 40. The city bike docking station that had been temporarily relocated during construction to Morton Street was moved back to its permanent home on the newly constructed path. A new traffic light is expected to be operational in the coming weeks after Con Edison makes some required connections. At the Gansevoort Peninsula, Stephen Dubner Landscaping has completed installation of the turf field and adjacent plantings. They're currently installing DEP infrastructure within the future sand area and are starting construction at the Hudson Balcony, which will extend slightly under the day's end sculpture, eventually providing stunning views of Lower Manhattan, the Statue of Liberty, and the Jersey City skyline. J.R. Cruz is completing the revised Bloomfield Street vehicular entrance and exit, as well as utility work. Curbing and utilities for the dog run and fitness areas are complete. Padilla Construction is making good progress on construction of the restrooms, concession, and park operation space, with walls beginning to be installed and cladding being fabricated off-site. EJ Electric continues to install lighting and utilities in support of Stephen Dubner, J.R. Cruz, and Padilla. A New York Times opinion article appeared last month positing that New York City was becoming Los Angeles and mentioning the future Gansevoort Beach as one of its evidence points. That one uh, article sparked yet another round of press requests regarding the beach, which continues to capture imaginations around New York City and beyond. As we have throughout the planning process, we are always careful to say 
that magical as we expect the southern edge of Gansevoir to be, it's not a place for swimming due to discharges from nearby CSOs and other issues. We've begun working on signage to help communicate this, and we know that this is also an important concern for other government agencies, including DEC, DEP, the Department of Health, we'll be working with some of you uh, to make sure that we're coordinated on that end. At Chelsea Waterside Park, Alpine, the site and landscape contractor, is installing herbs, walls, hardscapes, planting, and lighting in the central area and fencing around the sports field. And Athletic Fields of America has installed this new synthetic turf field. The turf field needs to remain off limits to play until sports field fencing, currently in production, is installed and a secure perimeter around the field is established. We're doing everything we can to try to hit our goal of reopening the fields in time for opening in spring, in spring, in spring. but of course we don't work in the fabrication shop. Meanwhile, E.W. Howell, the building contractor, has completed the comfort station's foundation, utilities, exterior walls, interior partitions, roof, and the building's repurposed granite cladding system, and is presently installing mechanical, electrical, plumbing equipment, exterior, interior, architectural finishes, restroom fixtures and accessories, and the solar panel photovoltaic system. Kevin Quinn, who is our senior VP of Design and Construction, says we are likely to beat the public park world record for public restroom construction. <laughs> so fingers crossed. Um, Maureen, yes. A question: How much are we paying for, a com for one compensation? Um, I feel like that's. Um, is that about three point three point four? Um, I can get you that number. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I feel like it's about three point four million dollars, gotcha. something like that. It's inherently inefficient. There are small buildings, um, and we are subject to Wix law, and it's just expensive. Right. Trying to figure out how to get it down. And what's the timing on the Gansevoort Peninsula? Um, late summer for Gansevoort, Pier 97, both. Um, this will open uh, in the spring. And hopefully the science play area will open, as you heard, uh, in fall. Okay. And Pier 57, um, ground floor, will be opening in early spring. So this is our 25th anniversary of the Hudson River Park Act. If you wanted to, you would never be able to plan for all of those things to <laughs> coincide. But it's going to be, hopefully, an incredible year for us. Our, um, and the artificial turf, um, is it a new kind of turf that you're using? Or no, we've been um, pretty consistently successful with the same type of artificial turf. We use the, it's the recycled chrome rubber, um, and it's, it's it's been successful for us. And um, do you have if you have flooding problems, is that particularly problematic with your artificial turf? No, um, it used to be at the original Pier 40 courtyard fields, and when they were redone um, and reopened during COVID, um, we were able to address the drainage there. There was a famous photo from Not Sandy where our staff kind of jokingly took out a canoe into <laughs> the courtyard fields at one point a decade ago, but there's no drainage issue now. And this one um, is on actual um, land, and this one drains just fine. We're happy to share whatever we've learned with anybody about Yeah, no, I mentioned your, the company. And okay. I, I thought it was Got it. Gotcha. So at Pier 97, work is also proceeding well. Concrete walls and curbs for planters are being formed at the new playscape. All granite veneer and curb material are on site, and almost all has been installed. Landscape boulders are being placed around the playscape and spray area. Drainage mats, geofoam fill, and lightweight structural fill are continuing to be installed in the emergency vehicle access lane. The metal deck for the overlook roof is being installed with a concrete slab to follow soon after. Coordination of utilities that will enter the comfort station is complete, and remaining portions of the building foundation frost wall will be poured in the next two weeks. This will be followed by installation of subgrade utilities and pouring the foundation's mat slab. I'm very happy to say that we're also completing the scope of services for a comprehensive design team for the unfinished park area between West 29th Street and West 46th Streets. It's an area of the park that certainly needs some greening and other improvements, but it's also going to be very challenging to design and eventually build as a result of numerous existing land uses, 
critical public infrastructure and tenancies. These range from the McLean Gateway Tunnel to the West 39th Street Ferry Terminal to the privately owned Pier 78 and our tenants at Circle Line. Vehicle access needs in coordination with multiple public and private partners will figure prominently in the design process as will com our commitment to working with the community during the design process. We're planning to release the RFP shortly and we'll be working with the board's design committee as proposals come in. So stay tuned. And I'll pause there for any questions on design and construction. Okay. It seems like just yesterday, that's the end of the visual presentation, um, that I was reporting on a very busy and successful 2022 season, but the Trust Public Programs Department is already working to develop our summer 2023 season plan. As you've heard about our park anniversary, we and friends are collaborating on a range of communications and sponsor sponsorship initiatives to celebrate the park. We're looking forward to sharing the exciting updates in early spring with you. Permit requests for guests have also continued to arrive throughout the winter, and our programs team continues to work to ensure that park space remains available and open to the public, while also trying to facilitate charity walks, film and photo shoots, special events, and more. This month, the Trust hosted two important annual meetings in adherence to commitments that we made as part of our Estuarine Sanctuary Management Plan action agenda. Staff invited research partners from the Borough of Manhattan Community College, SUNY Stony Brook, AKRF, Hudson River Foundation, New Jersey City University, Rutgers University, and Cornell University to meet with the Science Tech or Technical Advisory Committee to share updates on current projects being conducted in collaboration with the Trust. Other organizations, including New York State DEC, CUNY, Billion Oyster Project, and more have helped the Trust consider next steps in furthering regional institutional collaborations and the dissemination of research and data. Earlier this week, the Trust convened the full TAC for its annual meeting. Trust staff from various departments joined the Parks River Project team to share the 2022 Sanctuary Management Plan successes and anticipated areas of focus for the coming year. Collectively, the Trust shared updates from the Tribeca Habitat Enhancements monitoring effort, expansion of the Community Compost Program, current park design and construction, and many other projects currently underway. Overall, these meetings have been a helpful tool in engaging experts to further the Trust's progress and success in meeting sanctuary management goals. Our River Project was pleased to share that it received a $75,000 grant from the Pinkerton Foundation which is dedicated to improving the lives of young people in low-income neighborhoods in New York City. This funding will help support the park's Science Leadership Program, which is a paid research internship program for high school and undergraduate students that utilizes a tiered mentorship model to foster community, teach science skills, and build leadership. Over the course of the summer, students learn and grow through conducting field research, designing a scientific poster, and participating in leadership development workshops. The program also leverages partnerships from a network of New York City STEM institutions, including City College of New York, Columbia University, the Young Women's Leadership School, and the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. Thanks to the grant funding, we'll be able to expand the program by 50% in 2023. We expect to newly be able to provide honoraria for speakers and workshop facilitators, and to cover other program costs like stipends, uniforms, and supplies. Our River Project team is also participating in a consortium of similarly structured science research and mentorship and intern programs in New York City to share best practices, findings, and support. I'm proud to share that in the past year, nearly 30,000 people were engaged in 350 educational programs offered by the Trust River Project, including over 5,000 New York City students who joined us in person for school and summer camp trips. Work continued on our seven trust-led research projects focused on fish ecology, environmental DNA, oyster restoration, and more. The annual reports and data from these projects can be found on our website. I'll pause again for any questions here. Okay. As reported last month, the trust issued an RFP seeking operators for our four purpose-built non-motorized boathouses, and we received seven proposals. Our selection committee, led by our Assistant Vice President Rashi Puri, uh, sorry, Assistant Vice President of Real Estate and Planning, Rashi Puri, 
has been working with respondents on ways to maximize consistent, safe, and affordable access to the Hudson River while providing park visitors with a wide range of boating opportunities. Although we had hoped to make a selection by the end of 2022, we've extended our current permits to provide time for these discussions to continue. Last year, our boathouse has put an astonishing 68,000 people on the Hudson River, and we're looking forward to uh, announcing the selected operators at our next meeting, or before our next meeting. Um, uh, on a note that you may have just seen on your way in here, um, the, um, the terrorist um, from the October 31st, uh, 2017 bikeway attacks was convicted um, just this afternoon on all counts. Um, and um, the victims were in town for the trial, many of the victims and their families. Um, and the trust, along with the Belgian and Argentinian consulates, worked together to organize kind of a processional walk uh, during the first week of the trial. Uh, needless to say, it was heartbreaking. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, the next phase of the trial will involve the, uh, the penalty phase, whether it is life in prison or the death penalty, and then the civil phase of the trial in which HRPT is among the defendants along with the state, the city, and Home Depot will occur at some point thereafter. Uh, the trust also filed its MWBE and SDVOB annual goal plans with the state on January 13th, 2023. We continue to meet our annual 30% MWBE goal each year and expect to do so for the next fiscal year as well. We will not achieve the 6% SDVOB goal this year because the pool of vendors that perform the types of work needed for a waterfront park is still fairly small. It grows a bit every year. But the trust continues to strive to increase the number of SDVOB vendors it utilizes and did achieve a 3.58% utilization rate in 2022. The trust actively supports both the MWBE and SDVOB programs and all trust executives, department heads, and staff involved in contracting and purchasing receive routine training on utilizing the tools provided by the state to increase the procurement opportunities for MWBE and SDVOB certified firms. The trust has extended its use of discretionary procurements directed at MWBE and SDVOB firms based on our discretionary procurement threshold of $500,000 as set forth in our procurement guidelines. We also email procurement opportunities to both MWBEs and SDVOBs directly to encourage them to apply as prime contractors. As noted for the corporate actions approved by the board today, the trust will be entering into a new contract with an MWBE firm as the prime for the Dance Production Dance Festival and is expanding the services of an existing SDVOB prime for the access control upgrades. We hope to continue the practice of directly contracting with MWBE and SDVOB firms in addition to ensuring contractors meet the required subcontracting goals that we uh, enter into. Uh, similar to this past year, when in-person meetings resume, trust staff will attend MWBE and SDVOB conferences as a means to outreach to more vendors and to encourage them to submit proposals to the trust when offered. The trust is also working on developing a master mailing list of MWBE and SDVOB firms in order to conduct additional outreach before the new procurement opportunities are officially released. I wish to thank Sean Singh and Elizabeth Cologne of our team as they spend a huge amount of time uh, every year dedicated to making sure that we achieve our goals. Many other people do as well, everybody in this room does as well, but um, the two of them deserve a special shout out. And final. Sorry, yeah. you said you regularly exceed the 30% threshold. We do. What, what is the number you usually get to? About 31 to 30, uh, close to 33. And, and over the last few years, has that number been going up or remaining? It remains fairly static. Um, one of the things that uh, we have said over and over in our annual reports that we file is that a lot of our construction is marine construction, and it's not small docks. It's heavy-duty marine construction, and that is an area, for example, where um, all work at Pier 40, the primes for all of that, um, and that's the the vast amount of money is um, not, there, there aren't MWBEs that exist on that scale, at least locally, that would be able to mobilize and do that kind of work, maybe in some other states, but not 
nearby. So, yeah. Do you um, have any kind of consortium with any of the other like public-private partnerships, SPARC, and even Brooklyn Bridge Park, which has more sort of marine work, although they just sort of, they're not at the reconstruction point that you are at at this point. But do you sort of, there may be like a pooling of resources and of, of um, um, consultants and sub-consultants who do this sort of It's thing. a good idea. We don't have anything formal like that. We do do a lot of informal information sharing. Battery Park City right next yeah. to us is a good example where we actually look at their procurements and other things like that to take a look at um, what they're doing because they actually have also been very good historically at meeting or exceeding goals. Um, I mean, I, about 10 years ago, the state's goal for MWB participation was maybe something like 15%. I'm looking at the commissioner there, um, um, or this commissioner, former commissioner as well. Um, and you know, it, the goal increased very quickly. Um, and I think a lot of agencies had trouble getting to the 30%. Um, so one of the ways that we've been able to do it really is to try to look for primes, qualified primes. It's very difficult for certain things if you're only looking sub opportunities but you know it changes also from year to year with the nature of our projects so a bathroom construction is different from you know, a ball field um, so they're just really different projects and you, it, there are many agencies that more routinely do the same type of thing year in year out I think it's easier to build networks like that in our case it changes every year No, there didn't. are now enough. Of, I, I don't know what the Bronx River project has done or not done. They were doing some piers of the water as well. So it's a very good idea. Um, the MWB program, of course, though has different certifiers. City certification. We can only use people certified by the Empire State Development Corporation. I think there is some agreement to try to have expedited reciprocity um, of applications between the state and city, but sometimes if your job is has to occur fairly fast, waiting for that process because they were very backlogged on the ESDC side for a while can be a long time. I'm looking at my other state agency colleagues. They're trying to increase the pace of qualifying. So, I mean, I think... Personally, the fact that that is not an easy process. No. I tried to It's very difficult, yeah. and there are you know, sectors where there are certainly more people that are registered than others, and I, I do think over time that to the degree that the state and city, and I mean, I think the Port Authority has its own, or, I mean, so people have, there are many different certifi certification paths, and by statute, we can only use the ones we're allowed to use. But it is amazing how fast, I mean, there was no program really 11 years ago, just nothing. And most of the agencies were at 2% and and it's, uh, so it will get better, but yeah. it is impossible still, but it will get better. Um, you know, we, we, we hit a home run when we have um, large construction crimes that in our jobs. It's just, it's fantastic in every way. That's it for my report. I've got a question or two. Yeah. Has staff looked at the Army Corps of Engineers program to build a 700 foot wall along the west side? We have. We actually talked about that at the last meeting, which is a rare meeting that I think you were not able to attend. Right. Um, and we will be working on comments. We also are collaborating with some of our state partners to uh, make sure that we're all thinking of some of the types of questions that arise. Um, officially, you know, we're not going to be opposed to it, but we will be raising all the types of things that need to be considered, including the fact that that wall doesn't appear that it would actually protect park infrastructure. And so what we've always said when 
ever since Sandy at the federal, state, and city levels with respect to these um, kernels of ideas or more specific plans is that uh, we get it that Hudson River Park may on some level need to be sacrificial to a higher cause at some point. Um, but we do feel like it's our obligation to let people know, A, what kinds of technical information we know that they may not know. Um, for example, in the case of the Army Corps plan, you can see Hudson River Park on an app. It's a big regional plan, right? So they haven't had time yet to look at the details of every specific site along the way. Hudson River Park has um, 3,300 people that work within it. We have essential city and other municipal infrastructure. We have huge businesses like Chelsea Piers. We have all these driveways and other porous points where people need to come in and out. And while the plan does assume that there are these deployable barriers at certain places, how someone would do that many entrances and exits successfully in time if there's a flood coming, I certainly don't know. Um, and, um, and we're just four miles of that overall plan. So those are the types of things that we feel it's our job to make sure people understand. I actually did have one other uh, thing that I wanted to say, uh, which is that at the very end of last year, we received the fantastic news that Senators Chuck Schumer and Kirsten Gillibrand, as well as Congressman Nadler, were able to include $750,000 for Hudson River Park's growing habitat enhancement and community science initiatives to the federal budget. And that was in addition to the $1 million in funding that was secured by Congressman Nadler last March for pedestrian safety and security enhancements throughout the park. Uh, we'll be working to satisfy the various federal requirements for these two different programs once we know them. We expect that um, any expenditures associated with these two would be in FY25, not the coming fiscal year. Um, but it's really terrific news, and we feel so fortunate to have elected officials really at all levels um, in our courts advocating for us. And that is the end of my report. Thank you, Doreen. Um, do we have an advisory council report? So, Daniel Miller uh, reached out to say that unfortunately he's a last minute conflict and asked me to share a few updates on his behalf um, on behalf of the advisory council. Um, the first one, to go into Lowell's comment, um, was that they, uh, the advisory council has been looking hard at the um, uh, New, York, New Jersey Harbor Estuaries and Tributary Study, um, and that is uh, along with our community boards. They've all been doing it. Um, they had a very thoughtful discussion led by City Two's Chair of the Environmental Review Committee, William Benish, um, and they are coordinating their comments. They actually, it was quite a quite thoughtful discussion. Um, they also uh, wanted us to share that they had a, a great discussion about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, it was again set up by uh, Chair Daniel Miller, as well as the Little Island uh, Representative on the AC, Michael Wiggins. Um, we were joined by someone from uh, the Highland Networks, um, uh, uh, Highland Network, uh, which had their equity tool, toolbox. Um, we were looking at ways in which we can incorporate some of their uh, suggestions into both the AC's work as well as uh, how the trust can continue to further those. Um, we are looking forward to trying to help expand on our efforts this coming year. Um, Daniel mentioned at our last meeting um, that the Advisory Council continues to be uh, focused on patient security within the park, particularly in light of the incidents last year. Um, we were able to execute our running safety campaign in November based uh, on a suggestion from the Advisory Council. Um, and this coming year, we're going to be working uh, with our on water community in particular to enhance. Uh, looking at enhancing voting safety awareness and, and concerns. Um, I think it's in part funded by a grant received from DEC. Um, and Doreen mentioned both of us RFP. We met with both the advisory council to talk to them about the RFP and our need for the competitive procurement. Uh, we've also done uh, work with both CB1 and CB4 at this point to help make sure folks are aware that the RFP is coming um, and that, as Doreen said, we had seven responses. Uh, we only had four vote houses um, and that there may be some changes that are a result of it. That is, that is the easy stuff. Thank you for that update. Is there any further business for today's meeting? In response of our Chelsea Water Center Director of Lake Lake County, 2.95 million. Oh. <laughs> Savings. <laughs> um, if that's all, may I please have a motion to adjourn today's meeting? 
No love. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> the motion is approved. Thank you. The meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>